had some good playing. Good morning. How are y'all today? Good, and welcome to us from Facebook Live. So glad to have you this morning in our worship service. I was trying to get Michael Turner to come up here and switch places with me, but he wouldn't do it. So we're just going to go with what we got. So let's begin singing each step I take. I'll bring the fireworks if you didn't know. <laughs> good morning, and like Brother Bruce said, it is good to see all of you here this morning. So thankful to, to see you, and so thankful that you're here, and so thankful that you got here safely now that all the white snow's gone. And we're all amening and waiting for summer to come now. It is good to see you. Just a couple of announcements. Um, tonight, we'll, we will have our business meeting from two weeks ago. So those of you who uh, come and participate, then just be prepared to handle business this evening. And then uh, if you're... Following along our reading plan, then March is still out uh, side by the door. And so you can pick that up on your way out. If you need, if we run out, we'll make more copies and give it to you. But we'll be going through uh, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Joshua. And we also start March tomorrow. I believe it's the 28th, if I'm correct. Then we start March tomorrow, which means if you haven't been following along with this reading plan, you can start tomorrow. So grab it today, start it tomorrow, and follow along with us. And read God's Word, because it is an encouragement. And it is his, how he speaks to us. And then, so if you read it and you study it, he will speak to you through his word. And so uh, get involved in that if you would. Let's continue singing. But before we do, let's open our worship uh, up into a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the ability to come here, Lord. We thank you so much for sending your son to die on the cross, Lord. And we pray that if someone's here and they've never placed their faith and their trust in you, that they would do so before it's everlasting too late, Father. Lord, be with us through the remainder of this day. Protect us from the storms that are coming. Father, lead God and direct us as only you can. Lord, we pray for the preaching of your word, not only in our church here, but also in our sister churches, Lord, that we may all preach your word. And we pray that your word would convict us, Lord, to correct where we need correcting and repent where we need to repent. Father, be with us as a church that you would lead us, that we would follow faithfully and obediently after you. 
Help us all become more and more like Jesus and allow us to sing praises to you and allow everything we do here be for your honor and for your glory. Father, thank you so much for the day and thank you for your love for us. We praise you, we worship, and we, and we love you, Lord. It's in your holy son's name we pray. Amen. Brother Bruce. You remember what I said several weeks ago about when you saw me up here, what you were supposed to be doing? Been praying. Well, look who's here. Sister Christy just wheeled in, so she's here today. So our prayers are being answered, okay? And don't take it. Don't, don't work too hard now. Uh, we want you to come back full strength, okay? Let's sing about the old rugged cross.
to sit down and sing how great thou art I think don't you
seated. As we sing about his greatness, I do want to first talk about how great he really is. Because he is great. You see, there's, a, there's something that's, hap- that's happened when you've called upon the name of the Lord. And those of you who have placed your trust and faith in him. There's something that happens. And it's really something that you're called to. Ever, ever, ever felt called to something you feel just this, this burden laid upon you. Maybe you, you feel called to be at the job that you're in. Or maybe you feel uh, called to protect your, your child because as a parent you have that desire. You have that burden placed within you. It's kind of the same thing in the life of a Christian. When you place your faith and your trust in Jesus, there's a call placed on your life. And that, that is to become a witness for him. To proclaim the gospel message. But then a question I want to ask you is... That was a lot of rain. How serious are you? How serious are you about that call? If you really feel led to your job and you really feel like this is the field that you want to be in, then you'll typically try everything you can do to make it work. Maybe you have a bad coworker, but you're going to try extra hard because you really feel this is where you need to be. But feeling this call as a Christian, how serious are you about it? Because there's a level of serious seriousness that we need to take into account. And that's what we see in Acts chapter 5. We'll be in Acts chapter 5 this morning, and we're going to begin in verse 17. And we're just going to be talking about rejoicing while we go. That's going to kind of be our topic. And we're going to go through the remainder of chapter 5, and this is such an interesting passage to me. I absolutely love it, and hopefully at the time when we're done, you'll love it as well. But the first thing I want you to, to see is there's a danger when we talk about Jesus. There's a danger associated with Jesus. And it comes from Acts chapter 5 verse 17. It says, Then the high priest rose up and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation. And they laid their hands on the apostles and they put them in the common prison. So first off, there's two people in this two verses, but there's two dangers associated with Jesus. And the first one is from the outside. We're talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. There was a danger associated with this name of Jesus, specifically regarding them and their position, their character. Because these were the people, and it had been happening for years, these were the people in control. They could interpret. They they had the law. They understood what the law said. And so they could manipulate the people. And by doing that, they had this power. They had this position. But when a man named Jesus begins to start pressing the seams and trying to find the holes in their religion, there has to be something to stop him. Why? Because what's at stake? Well, our position, our power, our authority, everything's at stake. And so if this man, Jesus, is to actually come into Jerusalem and his doctrine to take hold, well, that then puts the Pharisees and the Sadducees in danger. But we killed him. Right? Jesus is dead. He's gone. That's not a problem anymore. Well, now there's these guys called the apostles. They're the disciples, they're the followers of Christ, and they're doing the exact same thing Jesus is doing. They're preaching, they're bearing witness, and so, once again, that threat is still there. And so what can we do? But then there's a danger also being a Christian. Because if we think about the apostles and the disciples that are within these verses, they were right there following Jesus. They were doing what God had commanded them to do, and now they, in verse 18, were then put in prison. There's a danger. Because when you start to press the seams and you begin to kind of press other people's authority and their power and their position, it then puts danger on you. And that's where we find these apostles. They're in danger. But I want you to see something in verse 19. Something's called the power of God. It says in verse 19, But at night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go stand in the temple and speak to all the people. Uh, All the words of this life. Now let's look down to uh, verse uh, 23. It says, saying, Indeed, we found the prison shut securely and the guards standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. 
So something had happened. Obviously, they, they'd gone to prison, right? They're cast in the common prison, the public prison for lawbreakers and such. They're within that prison, but that night, an angel of the Lord comes. He opens the prison doors. They, they walk out. But notice in verse 23, they call for the disciples, and they go to, they go to the prison. And here's the, here's the report that they bring back. They say, we found the prison shut securely and the guard standing outside before the doors. Now, I want you to understand the two miracles that are here. First off, it's an angel. An angel, you know, that's the ministering agent of the Lord. He sends an angel, and an angel opens the prison doors and allows them to walk out. But I want you to understand something. It wasn't just he opened the doors, and so when they go to the prison, the doors are found wide open, and behold, there's no prisoners. No, God shut the doors back, and God locked the doors back, and they did all this without the guards even knowing. Anyone can break out of jail, right? Bust a window. No, I say anybody, yeah. But anyone can just break a window or open a door. That, that's, that's normal things. We see they have climb the fence. But it's some, something else to take into the account that we're going to open, unlock this door, shut it, and lock it back. Why? Because what are we demonstrating? That there was a power of God involved in this miracle. The apostles didn't just break out. Something miraculous had happened to open the doors, to shut them back, because they couldn't find anything wrong. They found no holes in the fence. They had to walk out, literally, the front door. And so there obviously was some sort of power involved in this miracle. Now, I want you to see the command in verse 20. Here's what the angel tells them to do. Go stand in the temple and speak to all the people all the words of this life. Now, hold on just a moment. We've just been arrested for being in the temple and preaching the words of life. I want you to put yourself in their shoes. At this very moment, what are you going to do? God has just broken you out of jail, literally. Well, God let me out. I'm sure he did. God literally broke you out of jail, and now there's a command that you're going to go back to the same place that you were found and arrested in at the very beginning and do the exact same thing you were arrested at. I want to ask you, how serious are you about that call? Because the call isn't to try your best and then quit when things get hard. The call is to continue, to continue, and to continue. And so now there's a choice that has to be made. Do we go back to the temple, mind you, the most public place in their society, stand and talk about the same thing we were just arrested for, or do we head for the hills? Do we turn around and run away as fast as we can? Now notice the obedience in verse 21. And when they heard that, they heard the command from the angel, they entered the temple early in the morning and they taught. I would like to say immediately. As early as they could. Early in the morning they entered into the temple where God told them to go. And what did they do? They taught. They spoke the words of life. And so now there's a problem because now the, you know, the people who still think they're in jail, well, they're going to want to question them and bring them out. So that's what we see in verse 21. It says, But the high priest and those who came with him uh, uh, called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we found the prison shut securely and the guard standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now, when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. So one came and told them, saying, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you? not to teach in this name. And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. Now let's pause right there because that's a very interesting charge that, that he's bringing to the apostles. The first thing he says is basically, did we, have we not already discussed this before? Just a few chapters ago, this, they were charged not to talk about Jesus, not to preach in his name, not to teach in his name. And yet here we are again in the same situation and you're not obeying. And actually, in verse uh, 28, look what he says. And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, 
and you intend to bring this man's blood on us. That's interesting. Do you remember what, what they said at Jesus' crucifixion? Let this man's blood be on us and our children. You remember that? And now they understand that there's a danger here because it, the, the, his blood is really going to be applied to them. And they're trying to worm their way out of it. And now I want you to see really what Peter and the other apostles answer. He says, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Now start off and look at verse 29, the, the main quote. He says, we ought to obey God rather than men. This is not saying that you don't have to obey the law and obey what man says, right? Kids, you don't have the right to just disrespect your parents and don't obey a word they say. He's saying we obey men's law. We obey the rules. We're all law-abiding citizens. But when it contradicts what God has told us to do, we have to be obedient to God. And so Jesus has told us to be his witnesses. We have to listen. We have to be obedient. There's no other way around it. And now look what he says. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance of Israel, uh, to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Do you see a defense there? They're not saying the reason we were in the temple was to worship. They're not saying, well, the reason we were talking to people is because they were asking us questions. They began to stand before the most powerful council of Israel and preach the gospel. You see what they said in verse 30? It says, God of our fathers raised up Jesus. So there he is. He's brought to earth. He's born. Whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Now, in Roman context, the cross was terrible. But also in the Jewish context, the tree was terrible. And so by the most ridiculous, terrible way of death, you killed the very Son of God on a cross and on a tree. But in verse 31... Him, God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. He says, but you murdered him, but he didn't remain dead. What did he do? He is, is uh, sitting on the right hand of God the Father. He's been exalted. He's been ascended. And he's in heaven right now. And here's what he's doing. The whole reason for this in verse 31 is to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. You ever have someone ask you what the gospel is? It's that verse right there. Those couple verses right there. That's the gospel. And they're telling them to the Sanhedrin. And I want you to understand too, because maybe you've never heard the gospel. Jesus Christ came. He was raised up by God. God sent him to earth to live a life just as we did. But more importantly, in verse 30, to die. To die on a tree, to die on a cross. And in doing so, he became a sacrifice. He became the punishment, or he, 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 he paid the price for our sin. And then God, after his death, brought him back to life. He came back to life. And not only did he walk this earth, but he ascended back to the Father. And the whole reason he did this so that me and you could have repentance, so that we could have forgiveness of sin, because what happened on that cross is we hung him there. Peter's talking to the Sanhedrin saying, you murdered him. We all murdered him. We all stuck him on that cross because we've all done wrong. We've all broken his law and we've all sinned. Sin hung him on that cross and thereby our sin murdered Jesus Christ. And he became that sacrifice. And because of that transaction on that cross, what happened in verse 31 is repentance was offered to Israel, but forgiveness of sin was offered to the whole world. You can be forgiven of your sins, even for murdering the very son of God because he loved you so much. That he died on the cross for you. That's the gospel and that's the message they preached. They didn't give an argument. They preached what they knew. And so now we have a man named Gamaliel. He basically stands because in verse 33 it says, When they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. Because now what they've done is they've come into our council and they're spreading their heresy. And so they're so zealous, they're so uh, caught up that they're going to kill them. That's the plan. We're going to put them to death. But in verse 34, one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, 
a teacher of the law held in respect by all the people. And they commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. So we're going to have a Sanhedrin meeting. No apostles allowed. We're just going to be us, and we're just going to talk. And so what he says to them in verse 35, he says, Men of Israel, take heed to yourself that you intend, what you intend to do regarding this, these men. For some time ago, Thutis rose up, claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain. And all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. Now, I'm not a big fan of his advice, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, but a sliver of it remains true. In verse 38, basically in verse 39, what he says is basically, if this work, if what they're doing is of themselves and of man, it's going to fail. Why? Because the plan of men fail. They don't work out. But if it's of God, then we can't do anything to stop it. And that's right. If you have a problem with another person, be very careful. Because if it's thought of from you, it's very dangerous because you may find yourself fighting against God. That's his advice. If we think of these things, if, if the plan is of man and not of God, it's not going to succeed. But if this is from God and we fight against it, they're right, their doctrine's correct, and we fight against it, then we may find ourselves in this fight against God. So be very careful and how you do this. But we see his advice, and here's why I'm not a big fan of it. Gamaliel is really sitting on the fence. He wants to wait. He wants to wait and see. Guys, you can't do that when the gospel's been preached to you. You have to make a decision right then and there. Peter and, and the apostles, they, they stand before the Sanhedrin. They present the gospel and Gamaliel just wants to, to sit and wait around and see if this is really of God or if this is of man. Presented with the gospel, you either make a decision to accept it or you make a decision to reject it. And if you choose to wait, you're choosing to reject the gospel. You can't sit on the fence. You can't straddle both sides and be in the middle. You have to choose a side. You either accept the gospel or you reject the gospel. And so he gives this. And so in verse 40, look what they do. They agreed with him. That's a good idea, Gamaliel. And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. Now, I want you to understand what had just happened in verse 40, because this is very significant to understanding the whole point of the message. They, they agreed that we're not going to really do anything. We can't do anything, so we're not going to kill them. So they called for the apostles to come back in the room, and they beat them. And the word beat could also be flogged. So they took a stick or a whip and they beat them. And it wasn't just Peter taking it. It was all of them. They beat them. And when they were done beating them, in verse 40, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and they let them go. So what they do? The last time they just gave them a warning. Don't talk about Jesus. Don't teach about Jesus. Don't preach about Jesus. And they let them go. This time, there's now a consequence attached to their warning. And that consequence was a beating and a very, another harsh uh, warning. And I want you to think about in verse 40, if you were in that situation and you had just been beaten for the words you said, how would you respond? Because in America, we really have been cushioned to persecution. Five years ago, 21 Christians were killed by ISIS just because of the way they believed. Five years ago this month. Just because of what they believed. We kind of have it good here. We can gather together and worship and sing songs about our Lord and Savior. We can open up this book that's forbidden in a whole lot of countries to study it and to understand that this is the very word of God. We have it nice. And so if we were in their shoes, I'm not sure how, a lot, how many of us would preach after this. Just being real, because I'm not sure I would either. 
because this would be a terrible thing to go through, to be beaten. And not just a ruler on the slap of the hand. They beat them. They, they drew blood. It loosened skin. But notice in verse 41. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. I do not have a vocabulary strong enough to express to you how much I love verse 41. Because they just went through the most brutal thing they've faced. Right? They saw what Jesus faced, but they, this is something that they just experienced. Something they just went through. And when they left the council, notice what they did. They were rejoicing. Not just singing, oh, praise him. They were in this state of gladness. They were in, entirely happy. They were glad and they were thankful, rejoicing, that they were counted worthy. Notice what they were rejoicing for. That they suffered shame for his name. Have y'all seen those fitness shirts with, for, mainly for women, but they have like the back exposed? I really feel like this would be Peter and John. They would have those shirts because that would be a badge of honor to them. They would wear it proudly. Why? Because what they had just done, they had experienced what Jesus had gone through, and now they're going through it. Why? Not because of anything really they'd done, but just because they were being obedient to God. And so they left the council being beaten. I cannot stress that. that that's, that's awful to me rejoicing that they were counted worthy, that the Sanhedrin saw that they were fitting to beat them and to suffer shame for the very name of Jesus. They were proud of it. And notice in verse 42 what they did. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. You know, the scary thing is that we've been called to the same thing is to teach, preach, bear witness of our risen Savior. Even to this extent, that if persecution comes, and it will, that we rejoice in it. Later on, Peter wrote a first letter, it was just a general epistle, and in that letter, he really encouraged the saints that had been dispersed because of the persecution to rejoice in that persecution. And it translates to us that we should also rejoice. But the thing is that, we're not a big fan of persecution, right? Who is? But we consider persecution if your family doesn't like you because they know you believe in Jesus. Maybe your Facebook post didn't get liked because it mentioned the word Jesus. We haven't been beaten yet. This level of persecution hasn't come yet. So I want to ask you, how serious are you about this call that you've been called to? It's not an option. God doesn't say you can either preach about me and teach about me or you can just kind of sit on the sidelines. He says you preach about me. You be my witnesses. You declare that I am the risen Lord. And if persecution comes, then rejoice in it. I'm preaching to myself as well because that's the hardest thing I can think of is to preach after you've been beaten, to stand up and say the exact same words you were just beaten for. But that's the level of, uh, of a follower that we've been called to. That's the level of sincerity that we've been called to, that we follow our Lord and Savior as obediently as we possibly can. Why? Because at the end of the day, we ought to obey God rather than men. If men stands against us, then we have to obey God. Why? Because of how great He is. No one else on earth has ever paid the price for my soul. No one on earth can take me to heaven. The only way is by the blood and the sacrifice Jesus paid for me on the cross of Calvary. How great of a God is he? There's none like him. There's none who came and walked this earth just as we did, who went through the same temptations and the same tribulations that we do, who understands what we go through and he's there for us, but then who paid the price for our sin. So that in this life, when we leave it, we could have a fellowship with him in eternity. Tell me another story like that and I won't believe it. Because we don't deserve it. He's great. And he's called us to live this life. Not just be involved in a church that would be attached to it, but to live a life where we deny ourselves and we take up our cross. There was a reason he didn't tell us to take up our bed and follow after him. He said, take up your cross. Because it's going to be hard and it's going to be long. But I think about Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Jesus endured the cross. Why? Because of what was ahead of him. What he was looking forward to. 
Guys, we're just pilgrims here. Our world's not our, this world's not our home. Our home's in another place. It's in heaven with our God, with our Savior, with our King. And so for the joy that is set before us, let's go. Let's endure. And let's preach. We've been called to it. And it takes a serious person to answer that call. But that's the, that's the level that we all have to attain to. So I ask you this morning, how serious are you about that call? But more importantly, I want to ask you, have you ever been saved? Do you know that Jesus Christ is your Savior? There's no God, there's no king like Jesus. Because he loved you. Yes, he died for the whole world, but he loved you. Had it only been you who had the sin of the world, he would have still came and he would have still died on the cross for you. Why? Just because he loves you. And he wants to have a relationship with you. If you've never placed your faith and your trust in Jesus, don't leave here before it's everlasting too late. Don't leave here without knowing how great our God truly is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. And we thank you, Lord, for this passage of scripture. Father, allow us to reach that level where persecution comes. Lord, we will continue to stand and continue to be faithful, following and seeking after you. Lord, help us all to become more and more like you through your word and through just drawing close to you, Father. Lord, we pray for this invitation that we're about to have. We pray for those that need to respond. Lord, pray, we pray that the, those who have never placed their faith and their trust in you would do so before it's everlasting too late, Father. Lord, we ask that you would convict us where we need to uh, be convicted and we would repent where, we, where you see fit, Lord. Father, allow us to respond as needed. Move us as you would have us to move. Uh, be, uh, be with us and allow us to honor and glorify you, Lord. It's in your holy son's name we pray.